Welcome back, everyone. I encourage everyone in the room, if, if you would, to take your seats. Our next panel, uh, which has become an increasingly popular feature of III annual meetings, is a mock trial in a cross-border dispute. Today, we deal with a dispute with two between two countries, or not between the countries, but in parties in two countries, in Argentina and Singapore. We're really fortunate today to have as our moderator, Chief Judge Laura Taylor Swain, the Chief Judge of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Judge Swain has her BA degree from Harvard Radcliffe and her JD from Harvard Law School. And upon graduating from law school, Judge Swain clerked for a legendary judge in the Southern District of New York, Chief Judge Constance Baker Motley. Uh, after clerking for Judge Motley, Judge Swain practiced law with double voice in Plimpton in New York. Uh, and in 1996, Judge Swain was appointed as a judge on the US Bankruptcy Court for the Eastern District of New York. Uh, in 2000, Judge Swain was appointed by President Bill Clinton to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. So we're, we're proud that her origin at least came from the bankruptcy courts and of course to the District Court in the Southern District. Uh, Judge Swain is an adjunct professor at Benjamin Cardozo Law School Significantly, in 2017, Chief Justice John Roberts appointed Judge Swain under the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, PROMESA, to oversee the debt restructuring cases uh, of, the, of Puerto Rican government debt. That's still ongoing. Uh, in addition to her work overseeing the Puerto Rico matter, Judge Swain continues with her docket in the Southern District. She became Chief Judge of the District Court on April 10th, 2021. Uh, judge Swain is going to introduce the two judges and two lawyers who will participate in the mock trial, but we're so fortunate to have Chief Judge Swain as the moderator of our program, and I will turn the program over to her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Glenn, for that generous introduction. Our trial takes place- I think you're in, on mute. Oh, um, let me try this. Is this better? That's better, thank you. All right, um, I don't know what happened there. It told me I wasn't muted, but here I am. So good morning, everyone, and it is an honor to be here. I first would like to introduce our panelists, our trial scenario takes place in Argentina and Singapore. And so the Argentine judge and advocate are Justice Cristina O'Reilly of the National Commercial Court in Buenos Aires. Justice O'Reilly is a national commercial judge in Argentina and has been since 2005. She's worked in the Argentine commercial judicial system for the past 35 years. She's worked as a professor for several universities and has authored articles and books on Argentine commercial law. She is a member of III and INSOL. And the advocate for the Argentine portion of our proceedings is Fernando Hernandez, who received his law degree from Buenos Aires University School of Law and obtained an LLM at Columbia University School of Law. From 2002 until September 2021, he was at the Marval O'Farrell Myral firm. He was a partner from 2011 to 2021 and was head of the insolvency and restructuring department from 2015. In September 2021, he made a career shift joining Globant SA, a multinational New York Stock Exchange listed company headquartered in Argentina as the company's global legal senior director. 
but he is committing, committed to continue to be involved as a professor of law and in academic activities in the restructuring and insolvency fields. And he is honored to be a member of III. In Singapore, our proceedings will be presided over by Justice Edith Abdullah of the General Division of the High Court of the Supreme Court of Singapore. Justice Abdullah was appointed Judicial Commissioner in 2014 and a High Court Justice in September of 2017. He holds his Bachelor of Laws with first class honors from the National University of Singapore, as well as the Bachelor of Civil Law first class from the University of Oxford and a Master in Public Management from the National University of Singapore. He joined the Singapore Legal Service in 1995, beginning his career as a justice's law clerk. He has taught at the Faculty of Law of the National University of Singapore. He has served as Chief Prosecutor in the Economic Crimes and Governance Division and in the Criminal Justice Division at the Attorney General's Chambers in Singapore and served as special counsel and as senior counsel to the Monetary Authority of Singapore. He is the chair and member of various committees. And our advocate in Singapore is Sushil Nair. He, is, he has been named Singapore's Restructuring Lawyer of the Year for 2019. He's the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Drew and Napier and also heads up its corporate restructuring and workout practice group. He has been in practice for some 30 years with the majority of that time focused on restructuring. His practice is focused on the Asia, Asia Pacific region with much of it result, revolving around Indonesia and China where he has been involved in some of the largest restructuring exercises in Asia. He sits on the boards of several organizations and chairs the Insolvency Subcommittee of the Law Society of Singapore. Now I just have a note for those who are attending virtually regarding CLE. A code will be displayed in the chat partway through the session and you'll need to note that code and then an email will be sent out on Wednesday to all in-person and virtual attendees with information to obtain credit. And now turning to our scenario, I'm going to give you the background of the arguments that you'll be hearing. So first, Oro Mineria SA is an Argentine company that owns and operates a number of gold mines and gold refining and processing facilities in Argentina. A few years ago, it discovered a new load of gold ore in Patagonia but it needed substantial capital to construct the mine and the related processing and transportation infrastructure. Because of the ongoing financial crisis in Argentina and the scarcity of local capital, Oro Mineria sought finance, foreign investment to finance the mine project. So it established a wholly owned subsidiary in Singapore, which is called Patagonia Finance PTE LTD for the purpose of financing the new mine. Patagonia Finance, in turn, then created two subsidiaries for the purpose of owning, developing, and operating the mine. The first was a wholly owned Singapore subsidiary named Golden Opportunities, PTE LTD. Golden Opportunities was a holding company for a newly created Argentine subsidiary, Mina de Oro SA, and that subsidiary, Mina de Oro, owned and operated the Argentine mine. The financing for the project was obtained in Singapore through the issuance of 500 million US dollar, 500 million US dollars in bonds. And those bonds are governed by Singapore law. They include an exclusive jurisdiction clause in favor of the Singapore courts, and they are payable in Singapore in US dollars. The issuer and primary obligor on the bonds is Oro Mineria, which is the Argentine company. Patagonia Finance, the Singapore subsidiary, guaranteed the bonds. And 
Patagonia's guarantee is secured by a pledge of its stock in Golden Opportunities, which is the wholly owned Singapore subsidiary. And then of course comes the pandemic. Although Argentina has strict currency controls, the bonds were to be repaid through hard currency revenue generated by the export and sale of the gold produced by the Patagonia mine. And the payments were scheduled to begin in January of 2021. The global pandemic interrupted the plans to have the mine fully operational by January 2021 and an additional $150 million in financing is needed to complete the mine. But the new round of financing depends on restructuring of the original $500 million bond debt to extend the payment dates and reduce the principal obligation to $350 million. The alternative is liquidation, where it's clear that the bondholders would receive far less. And so we come to the restructuring. Argentina has not adopted the model law and has no effective mechanism for recognizing and enforcing a Singapore insolvency order. And so the enterprise group decided to attempt to restructure the group debt through an Argentine restructuring proceeding instituted by the Argentine parent corporation, Oro Mineria. Patagonia Finance could not file a concurrent proceeding in Argentina because it had no assets there. So the Oro Mineria restructuring plan reduced the principal on the Singapore bond debt to $350 million and extended the payment dates by two years. The plan also included a sort of third party release provision whereby the guarantee debt of the Singapore subsidiary Patagonia Finance was adjusted to match the restructured obligation of the parent. The subsidiary's guarantee obligation as adjusted remains secured by the golden opportunities stock. The plan was adopted by 90% of the bondholders, which is well above the necessary majority for approval under Argentine law. The only objector was a US hedge fund, Pandemic Opportunities Fund, that purchased 10% of the bonds at a deep discount shortly before the Argentine restructuring began. Before the sanction hearing for the Oro Minería restructuring plan in the Argentine court, Pandemic Opportunities Fund commenced proceedings in the Singapore court against Oro Minería and Patagonia Finance and sought to enforce its security rights over its pro rata share of the golden opportunities stock on the basis that Oro Mineria had defaulted on the bonds. You should assume that the no action clause does not in the present circumstances bar the individual bondholder from commencing the enforcement action against the issuer and the guarantor to exercise security rights over its pro rata share of the golden opportunities stock. And so our mock trial begins in Argentina with the judicial proceedings in the National Commercial Court, where the Argentine court considers the novel question of whether the restructuring plan of an Argentine parent can adjust the guarantee obligations of its foreign subsidiary. Now we go to Argentina. Justice O'Reilly. Thank you, Judge Laura. Um, it's a pleasure for me being here, uh, and thanks to the IIII for inviting me to participate again. And so we, we will start uh, due to the uh, time constraints. So good morning, Your Honor. Uh, my client, Oro Minaria, is an Argentine entity, uh, and as issuer, um, uh, will file a joint petition for organization under the Argentine insolvency law, uh, uh, together with its subsidiary, Patagonia Finance, which is a Singapore entity as guarantor. Uh, so we will request admission of the joint petition. And in respect of Patagonia Finance, venue in your court is proper under section two of the Argentine insolvency law to the extent that Patagonia Finance is the indirect holder of assets in Argentina. An equity interest in the Argentine company Mina de Oro, owner of the mine exploitation business in Argentina through uh, another Singapore uh, subsidiary, which is Golden Opportunities. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you. 
Good morning, Councillor. You are filing a joint petition for reorganization for your clients, Oro Mineria and its subsidiary, Patagonia Financing, a Singapore entity. In respect of Oro Mineria, according to Section 2 of the Argentine Insolvency Law, being an Argentine entity with assets in Argentina, the petition will be granted. But the scenario for Patagonia financing its subsidiary in Singapore is quite different. Being indirect holder of assets in Argentina is not enough for our law to allow the petition for reorganization in our country. Our bankruptcy law requires a necessary condition. Whoever files a petition for reorganization must have and own assets in Argentina. That's not the case of Patagonia financing. The alleged circumstance of being indirect holder of assets in Argentina is not relevant for our law. You must have assets. An indirect holder is not allow, allowed to file the petition. So, Councillor, if you choose to file the petition only for Oro Mineria, I will allow it and we can continue with the procedure. If not, I will be obliged to reject the joint petition. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, upon your decision on the jurisdiction over Patagonia Finance, then my client is going to, is filing a petition exclusively for the reorganization of Oro Mineria. Okay, Councillor, the petition for reorganization of Oro Mineria is admitted, so the reorganization proceeding is open. Thank you, Your Honor. After admission of the Oro Mineria organization uh, petition, we have categorized the claims under the Oro Mineria bonds in a single category, including just those bonds. All other unsecured and secured creditors have been included in other separate categories. I have no objections to the way you categorize the claims. Please, I want to hear about the plan. Thank you, Your Honor. My client, Oro Mineria, files a, a proposed plan for creditors' approval, which plan includes uh, provisions as to the satisfaction of all unsecured and secured claims from all unsecured and secured creditors, other than the holders of financial, uh, other than the holders of the Oro Mineria bonds, under their original terms. So there will be no restructuring in respect of all those claims. And in respect of the restructuring of the Oro Mineria bonds. Uh, the plan will provide for uh, a haircut of 30% of the principal amount outstanding equal to, in this case, $150 million uh, and extending the maturity for two additional years. In addition, the plan uh, will include uh, the consent of the Oro Mineria bondholders to the release, partial release and restructuring of the Singapore entities, uh, which is Patagonia Finance guarantee under uh, the bonds. Okay, I will analyze the plan later. I want to know if you, uh, in your view from the creditor standpoint, what are the benefits for the restructuring against the liquidation? Your Honor, Oro, uh, Oro Mineria is just a holding company, which only asset is the equity participation in the guarantee which is Patagonia Finance. And Patagonia's finance only asset is the equity participation in Golden Opportunities, which has been granted as security for the guarantor's guarantee obligations. In turn, Golden Opportunities is the parent company of Mina de Oro, the mine operating entity in Argentina, that also constitutes its only asset. On the other hand, the main assets of Mina de Oro are the governmental exploration permits and exploitation concessions, which will be revoked in case of bankruptcy. Therefore, in the event of a liquidation, the creditors of Oro Mineria, including the holders of Oro Mineria bonds, will have a very low chance of recovering a minimal portion of their original claims. A restructuring, on the other hand, will provide the Oro Mineria creditors the possibility of recovering their restructured claims from the cash flow from the mine operations and will contribute to the protection of the mine workers' source of employment in Argentina. Thank you so much. And now I want to know if you read the majorities needed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, yes, my client obtained the required majorities under the Argentine Insolvency Law for approval of its recognition plan according to uh, the following. 
In respect of all unsecured and secured categories of creditors other than the holders of the Oro Mineria bonds, and to the extent that they were offered satisfaction of the claims under their original terms, the approval of the proposal to them is deemed accepted without need of their express consent. In respect of the holders of the Oro Mineria bonds, to the extent that such bonds are governed by Singapore law and not, not under the Argentine negotiable obligations law, obtention of their consent is governed by the terms of the indenture for the Oro Mineria bonds in accordance with section 45 bis paragraph five of the Argentine insolvency law and must be computed in the manner described in the indenture. According to the foregoing, uh, the regulations regarding the approval and um, before um, through a, a bondholders meeting does not apply in this case. The proposal for um, this category has been approved by holders of the Oro Mineria bonds, representing 90% of the bonds in principal amount and a total of 234 beneficial owners of the bonds that represent more than 75 of the beneficial owners of the bonds on a headcount, a headcount basis. Um, so uh, under the Argentine law, uh, we, the, my client have obtained the required majorities for, uh, and for approval and for endorsement of the plan. Pursuant to the, for all the foregoing, we request endorsement of my client's reorganization plan, upon which endorsement the restructuring of the Oro Mineria um, uh, plan uh, and the partial release and restructuring of the guarantee granted by Patagonia Finance will be binding against all holders of the Oro Mineria bonds. Okay, Councillor. So now I have to decide whether to approve or not the plan. You have said that a liquidation is not a good option for the creditors because they will, not, they will have a very low chance of recover, recovering a minimal portion of their original claims. That the only possibility of recovering their structural claims and protect jobs is with the protection of the mine. Let's see. It's a fact that Oro Minería needs the new round of financing of $150 million in order to complete the mine, stay afloat and pay off the debt. It is also a fact that the financing depends upon the approval of the plan. So it's a hard situation here. Either the plan is approved or Oro Minería must file for liquidation. There are two situations which may pose a concern. First, as you know, our bankruptcy law section 45 bis establishes a special procedure for the bondholders to vote. But this procedure is only enforced when bonds are ruled by Argentine law. As the bonds we are talking about are governed by the Singapore law, they can only be treated in this case as unsecured creditors, so there's no need of the unanimous consent. That's why the majority obtained in that category is enough for our law. Second, the plan not only reduces the debt of Oro Mineria and extends the payment dates by two years, but adjusts the debt of Patagonia Finance, the Singapore subsidiary, guarantor of the payment to match the restructure obligation of the parent. Under Argentine bankruptcy law, the debt of the guarantor is not adjusted to match the restructure obligation of the primary obligor. Both obligations are independent. I have to say, but in this case, I have no objection that the bondholders decided to release the guarantor. I have to say that I have jurisdiction to rule over the plan proposed to the bondholders, taking into account that, that as I have said before, they are unsecured creditors. If the bondholder who didn't accept the plan wants the recognition of his rights as a secured creditor, he will have to file his petition in Singapore. Having said that, I must decide whether to approve or not the plan. Well, the debtor, the debtor obtained the necessary majorities. 
the plan appears to be reasonable and in no way against public policy. The trustee supports the plan. The only possibility that Oro Mineria has to stay afloat is with the 150 million round of financing. Pursuant to all the foregoing, I approve the plan. Thank you, Your Honor. So now we can move uh, Judge um, Honor Laura to, to Singapore. Yes, so since the plan has been approved in Argentina, um, we will now go to the General Division of the Supreme Court of Singapore to see whether the provision of the Argentine plan reducing the guarantee can be enforced under Singapore's version of the model law. Um, Justice Abdullah is presiding and Mr. Nair is the advocate. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Sushil Nair, and I act for the administrator for Oro Mineria, a company incorporated in Argentina, which owns and operates a number of gold mines and gold refining facilities and processing facilities in Argentina. Uh, Your Honor, I, I wonder if you've had an opportunity to, to uh, review the, the factual statement that I'd put in uh, in my uh, submission. You thank require. you, Mr. Nair. The submissions can be taken as read. I think you can get to the meat of your arguments for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I mean, the, in terms of the facts, I suppose the only ones that I would uh, reiterate, Your Honor, is that the scheme has uh, been sanctioned and passed. The scheme has the effect of uh, releasing the obligations of the guarantor. And the scheme was uh, obtained the overwhelming support of 90% in value of the bondholders in Argentina. Um, Your Honor, moving first, in terms of uh, the prayers that I seek uh, uh, Your Honor's assistance on, first uh, would be asking Your Honor to uh, agree that the Argentine restructuring proceedings are a foreign main proceeding under the Singapore model law. And secondly, that uh, the order, the, the Honorable Court grants relief under Article 7 and or Article 21 of the Singapore model law to enforce the terms of the Argentine restructuring plan. Uh, including the dismissal of the Singapore proceedings. Your Honor, in relation to the first issue, Comey, I think uh, the only question really, sir, is uh, whether Argentina is the Comey of our, uh, well, the applicant. And Your Honor, it is incorporated in Argentina, and so the presumption that Argentina is its Comey uh, pursuant to Article 16.3 of the Singapore Model Law applies. And uh, it operates a number of gold mines and gold refinery and processing facilities there. So no party appears to be in a position to take the point that uh, the incorporation does not apply. And so I would uh, submit, Your Honor, that Comey is quite easily established in this case, and therefore it should be a foreign main proceeding, sir. Yes, I, I don't see anything that would displace the presumption under the uh, model law, and we can take it that Argentina will be taken as a Comey in this case. You may, you may proceed to your next prayer. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Uh, Your Honor, with respect to the second uh, issue, the question of whether relief under Article 7 or 21 of the Singapore Model Law to enforce the terms of the Argentine restructuring plan should come into effect. It is the applicant's submission that this honorable court can and should recognize and enforce the terms of the Argentine restructuring plan, and that enforcement should include the um, release of third party guarantors, in this case, Patagonia Finance, the Singapore company. As a preliminary point, as set out in your honor's decision in Ray Rooftop International, uh, the model law is applicable to the subject matter. Where the model law is applicable to the subject matter, the Singapore court would be slow to allow common law recognition to be invoked. So the existence of the model law regime displaces the need for the common law doctrine to apply. And so we will uh, proceed our, with our argument on the basis of the model law. Your Honor, on the issue of the recognition of the terms of the Argentine restructuring plan, the Singapore High Court had earlier last month granted an order under the Singapore model law, recognizing and giving full force and effect to a US chapter 11 plan and confirmation order in relation to CFG Peru a Singapore incorporated subsidiary of the China Fishery Group. Your Honor, the written grounds of this decision have not been released as yet, 
However, the fact that a plan and confirmation order is being given recognition goes some way to addressing the issue of whether a Singapore court would follow the US approach, which is in the appropriate case to give recognition to and then provide enforcement of the terms of a foreign sanction scheme, including where appropriate third party releases, or the English approach, which adopts the more conservative view that the model law is not designed to provide for reciprocal enforcement of judgments. And once a scheme is sanctioned, it is no longer open to parties to seek relief under the model law in relation to the enforcement of its terms. It is the applicant's submission that the Peru case is a step in the right direction and the Singapore court should similarly extend the same recognition and reliefs to a restructuring plan that has been approved by the Argentine courts. Let me first deal quickly with the English position, sir. In Rubin and Eurofinance, the UK Supreme Court held that the model law is not designed um, to provide for the reciprocal enforcement of foreign insolvency judgments because first, uh, the English model law and unsettled model law says nothing about the enforcement of foreign judgments against third parties, and it would be surprising if the unsettled model law was intended to deal with judgments in insolvency matters by implication. Secondly, the US decision in Ray Metcalf involved uh, involving enforcement of orders made by the Canadian courts in relation to a plan of compromise applied the normal rules in non bankruptcy cases for enforcement of foreign judgments in the US and not the model law. And finally, sir, the assertion was that articles 21, 25, and 27 are concerned with procedural matters. Uh, more recently, sir, in the uh, case of Ray o OJSC International Bank of Azerbaijan, the EWCA also stated that the position in Australia and England and Wales is that the court is unable to grant relief under the model law beyond the end of the foreign uh, restructuring proceedings uh, for amongst other reasons. First, relief under the model law should not be granted so as to continue beyond the date of termination of the relevant foreign proceeding. Such a limitation would be consistent with the procedural and supportive role of the model law. And secondly, uh, because the background to the incorporation of the model law in the US differs significantly from that in Great Britain, Australia. Now, Your Honor, it is my humble submission that this honorable court should adopt the approach taken by the US courts. Under this approach, scheme debtors can apply under sections 1507 and 1521, uh, which are equivalent to 7 and 21 of the Singapore model law, for post recognition relief of the enforcement of the scheme sanction orders made in a foreign proceeding. Such relief can also extend to non scheme debtors under a third party release. Uh, just for completeness, Your Honor, Article 7 of the model law states that nothing in this law limits the power of a court of a Singapore or a Singapore insolvency office holder to provide additional assistance to a foreign representative under other laws of Singapore. And Article 21.1 of the Singapore model law, which largely mirrors the, mirrors the US Section 1521A, sets out the relief that the Singapore court may grant upon recognition of a foreign proceeding. In particular, Article 21.1G states that the Singapore court may grant any additional relief that may be available to a Singapore insolvency office holder. So, Your Honor, the US position, there are a number of cases that deal with the enforcement of a foreign sanction scheme involving third party release provisions. I'll just deal with a few. First, you have Ray Vitro, a 2012 case which involved a Mexican restructuring plan. Uh, Ray Avanti, a, two, a 2018 case involving an English scheme of arrangement, and uh, Ray P.T. Bakri, which involves an Indonesian restructuring plan, and that was in 2021. And if I could take your honor to the Ray Avanti case. In that case, the court enforced the English scheme of arrangement and enjoined, the US courts enforced the English scheme of arrangement and joined parties from uh, taking any action inconsistent with the terms of the English scheme in the US, including third party releases for the following reasons. First, they stated that it was a well, it was well set, settled case law in the UK that expressly authorizes third party releases in scheme proceedings, particularly the release of affiliate guarantees. And your honor will know that that is also the position in Singapore, third party releases are recognized. The English scheme, which similarly involved a principal deliveraging and an extension to maturity date, was overwhelmingly approved by 98% of the scheme creditors, 
similar to the 90% in this case, sir. Then the ski English restructuring proceeding was recognized as a foreign main proceeding, as your honor has kindly done in this case as well. And finally, while the interplay between the relief available under sections 1507 and 1521 were far from clear, the US court held that in deciding whether to grant appropriate relief or additional assistance under chapter 15, the courts are guided by principles of comity and cooperation with foreign courts. Finally, Your Honor, in that case, the court determined that there was no evidence that the scheme creditors did not have a full and fair opportunity to vote on and be heard in connection with the English scheme in the English restructuring proceedings. And the failure of a US bankruptcy court to enforce the guarantor releases could result in prejudicial treatment of creditors to the detriment of the scheme debtors reorganization efforts and prevent the fair and efficient administration of the restructuring. And that is also the case here, sir. It's absolutely essential that we have those releases. So, Your Honor, it is my humble submission that this honorable court should adopt the US approach and grant relief under Article 21 of the Singapore Model Law to enforce the terms of the Argentine restructuring plan. Now, Your Honor, I have a number of reasons to back up this argument and this submission. First, Your Honor, a degree of guidance can be obtained from the model law on recognition and enforcement of insolvency related judgments. Uh, I will refer to that as the model law on enforcement, which was applied by, uh, which was uh, adopted by Ansar in 2018. While this has not been adopted in Singapore as yet, this document provides clarity on the intended scope of Article 21 of the model law. In particular, sir, Article 10 of the model law on enforcement provides that notwithstanding any prior interpretation to the contrary, the relief available under, and then you, uh, the, 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 the enacting state puts in its section, would include recognition and enforcement of a judgment. I wish to highlight, Your Honor, that as set out in uh, the guide to the model of enforcement, Article 10 of the model law of enforcement is not an extension of the scope of Article 21 of the model law, but a clarification. Accordingly, it is humbly submitted that the article, that that Article 21 of the Singapore model law was intended from its conception to empower and enable the court to enforce foreign insolvency related judgments and orders. And that's consistent with the clarification given by Ansitrov. Secondly, Your Honor, the Singapore Ministry of Law has considered the differences in the interpretations of Article 21 under US law and English law, and has expressly endorsed the US approach over the English approach. In the ministry's response to feedback from public consultation on the draft company's amendments bill in, uh, of 2017, the ministry addressed this issue at paragraphs 11.2.1 and 0.2 as follows. In respect of Article 21.1G, we received a comment that despite similar wording in their respective provisions, the UK and the US differ in their approaches on the scope of relief that may be granted. It was therefore suggested that Singapore should signal whether the US or UK approach should be adopted in respect of relief that may be granted under Article 21 g After consideration of this issue, the suggestion has been noted and accepted. Thus, this provision has been amended to align the wording with the US provision in Chapter 15 of the US Bankruptcy Code. Accordingly, Your Honor, in making the clarification and amendment to Article 21 of the Singapore Model Law, the drafters of the bill have expressed a clear preference for the US approach in relation to the interpretation of Article 21. Next, Your Honor, the interests of the creditors will not be prejudiced since the Singapore court retains the discretion to deny, to deny relief under Article 22.1 if the court is dissatisfied that the interests of creditors are not adequate, adequately protected, and Article 6, if the court is of the view that it is contrary to the public policy of Singapore. In the present case, Your Honor, circumstances are clearly in favor of enforcing the Argentine restructuring plan. If the Singapore court refuses to grant such relief, this would likely result in the prejudicial treatment of creditors to the detriment of the scheme debtors and reorganization efforts and prevent the fair and efficient administration of the group restructuring, as highlighted by the US court in Riavanti. I would therefore humbly submit, Your Honor, 
that the US approach should be adopted and this honorable court should recognize and enforce the terms of the Argentine restructuring plan. That Singapore has taken a more expansive view in embracing comity is borne out by its approach to Article 21, as I've submitted. And indeed, Your Honor, the rejection by our courts of the limitations of the UK's Gibbs principles, which uh, provides that a discharge of variation of a debt is not effective unless it is in accordance with the law governing the debt. Our courts in Ray Pacific Andes uh, were minded not to follow the Gibbs principle, and that's so consistent with the expansive approach we've taken uh, in relation to comedy. So, Your Honor, if you are with me on that issue, I will very quickly move to the question of third party releases, sir. Or shall I pr proceed with that and then uh, Your Honor can consider things in the round? Oh, uh, yes, I think perhaps uh, briefly. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I would uh, submit, sir, that if you're with me uh, in recognizing and, rec uh, and uh, the right to recognize and enforce the Argentine destruction plan, the court should also give release uh, effect to the third party releases contained therein. This is consistent with the position taken in Singapore. Uh, Singapore allows and accepts uh, that third party releases can be granted if there is sufficient nexus and guarantees uh, between related companies is an accepted uh, nexus. And in this case, uh, it's the, it, it is, I would submit, the classical nexus because it is a guarantee uh, by a related company. Uh, Your Honor, finally, I would say that uh, there is also uh, sought a release of security, uh, in, and not really a release, sir, where the security is to be uh, amended so that it follows the uh, amendments to the original uh, scheme in Argentina. Uh, Your Honor, the only case of concern would be United Securities and UOB. But Your Honor, in that case, the Singapore courts allowed for the uh, security holder to, to enforce security in the context of a winding up. And it's recognized in Singapore that a winding up does not prevent a security holder from exercising security. And so the Singapore courts allowed the security holder to proceed. Uh, in this case, Your Honor, it's different because the security holder, 90% of them are happy to have the uh, security amended in the way it was. Uh, the only holdout is a 10% security holder, and uh, the Argentinian courts have uh, allowed uh, the scheme to be uh, sanctioned, notwithstanding that 10% uh, holder's objections. Your Honor, it should follow that the amendments to the security would apply in Singapore as well. So, Your Honor, for those reasons, I would uh, ask the court that to recognize and enforce the terms of the Argentinian, uh, Argentinian scheme. And in that respect, to also extend that recognition to the third party releases and to the amendments to security, sir. That, that's all uh, I have for you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nair. I think of the various matters you have raised, some of them can be dealt with rather briskly. Uh, firstly, of course, as you've submitted, third party releases are not an issue not under our law, uh, provided there is sufficient nexus. And the Court of Appeal decision in PAR finally lays it out clearly. And I see no reason to find anything an issue in the present case. Secondly, the rule in Gibbs, while alive in its home jurisdiction, is uh, quite dead uh, in Singapore. Oh. And I don't think I'm going to be the one to try to revive it here. And Thirdly, in relation to the amendment of security, I think given the majorities reached in Argentina, that also would not be an issue. The only area of uncertainty involves the question of recognition uh, of the Argentinian re uh, restructuring judgment. And I note your presentation of the conflicting authorities and while English and Australian decisions are indeed what they respect, it is open to us as we have done to develop our own approaches and in the circumstances we could consider, as we have in other situations, follow the lead of non-commonwealth jurisdictions such as the United States. And I believe this has already been foreshadowed in the decision in Ray CFG uh, Peru. So in the present context, I would, I think, be inclined to follow the US authorities that personally advised. Uh, there is strength, I think, in the argument that the model law and its local enactment should be read as far as possible to avoid a scramble for assets and inconsistency in results across jurisdictions 
So facilitating the recognition of uh, judgments would avoid uh, such an outcome. And in any event, even if it is not possible to fit the present situation within the model law, I think there may be scope for further consideration of the application of our common law recognition doctrines, uh, notwithstanding my own remarks and rooftop. So this might be a different situation, but in the grand tradition of common law courts uh, in these modes, I will reserve judgment uh, and deliver my decision on another day. Thank you. Singapore Court rises. Thank you, Justice Abdullah, and thank you to all of our fine participants and um, and Justice O'Reilly and Messrs. Nair and Hernandez for their uh, challenging and fascinating arguments. Are there questions for the panel? Um, virtual participants can put questions into the chat, and participants who are live can um, signal and I understand that they will be able to ask their questions from the floor. Are there, are there any questions from our live uh, attendees? I have a couple of questions. Well, go ahead, Deborah. Deborah Grassgreen um, has a question. Good morning. And maybe later for others on the panel, thank you. I'm just wondering what happened to the parent company for which recognition was not granted in Argentina? Because I, if I understood, there was, there was not a separate proceeding for that entity in Singapore. What happened to it? Justice O'Reilly, did you, or Mr. Hernandez? You need to unmute Justice O'Reilly. Did that entity just um, stay out of any type of insolvency proceeding? And no, I granted the the the. I recognized the plan for the parent, not for the subsidiary. What happened to the subsidiary? In the subsidiary, uh, it's uh, it's it can't file uh, uh, his. Uh, uh, for recognition in Argentina because he doesn't have as assets in Argentina. You need to have assets in Argentina. So if he wants to file a petition, I don't know, he has to go uh, somewhere else or to go to Singapore and ask if, if, if the recognition can, uh, or, or he can uh, uh, reorganize there, but not in Argentina. It's, it's a sine qua non condition that you have to have assets in Argentina to ask for a, a reorganization. So, so the restructuring of the debt at the parent sufficiently restructured the debt at the subsidiary such that you would not need to have a proceeding for the subsidiary, is that? Uh, no, because I, I analyzed that the decision of the bondholders to release the debt of in, in a portion, of course, of the of the subsidiary, it was not against public policy, and it was their own volition to say, "I don't want to go against him." So that's why I approved the plan. Thank you. Any other questions in the audience? Let me ask first. I want to thank Professor Ray Warner of St. John's Law School for all of his work with the judges and lawyers in developing the trial hypothetical. Um, but I have a question for uh, Fernando and for Justice O'Reilly. What if the order of the proceedings was reversed and Singapore had initially uh, sanctioned the plan or scheme and then recognition and enforcement was sought in Argentina, which has not adopted the model law. Uh, what would the likely result be in Argentina? Justice O'Reilly, I don't know whether you want to- uh, Yes, it will Fernando be- Fernando first or, but uh, go ahead. Whatever, Fernando, you want to go first? No, no, please go ahead, um, Christina. You know what, we have uh, really, troublesome, long proceeding called exequator 
that it's the way to recognize any ruling, not only in bankruptcy, uh, in the bankruptcy field, but in any, other, in any other kind of ruling, that it takes time, it takes, I don't know, a long procedure, it's outdated, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, I, I say, uh, I wouldn't recommend to do it. it. We have the recognition of uh, international rulings, but uh, it's a long proceeding. Yeah, in, in, in addition, in Argentina, <clears throat> to the extent that we have not adopted the model law, uh, the Argentine courts will not recognize the foreign proceedings as a main proceedings like Singapore. So in Argentina, under Argentine law, the only effect of any uh, sanction or endorsement or uh, approval of uh, a foreign reorganization proceeding is that in Argentina, to the extent that the company has assets in Argentina and has creditors in Argentina, then the Argentine courts may institute or commence an insolvency proceeding in Argentina based on that insolvency proceeding outside of Argentina, which is deemed as, um, as a proof that the, uh, the debtor is in insolvency in an insolvency situation. But the Argentine court will not recognize uh, foreign proceedings as main proceedings to extend we, we have not uh, yet adopted the, uh, the model law. Yes, but this, this will be uh, something uh, uh, totally independent you have assets here, you said you can pay, so you file for the petition for uh, reorganization, but it has nothing to do, it's not a consequence of the, uh, uh, of the reorganization uh, outside. So we need the model law, it's, it's, it's crucial we yeah. have it. And that also is to extend that there are creditors payable in Argentina, right? Where Argentine law does not discriminate against foreign creditors, even an Argentine creditor, which is paid outside of Argentina, will be deemed a, a, a creditor uh, uh, for these purposes. So it's, it's not um, some related to the nationality, but where the payments are made. So there is a case that I think, uh, Christina, have never been a case, uh, I, I don't remember, where um, there is a filing for recognition in Argentina and there are no creditors at all in Argentina. So if there are no creditors in Argentina, payable in Argentina, then the outcome would be different because there is no need to uh, institute those proceedings in Argentina. But I think there is no precedent in this regard. No. So Justice O'Reilly, I know for a long time you've been involved in law reform efforts in your country. Yesterday, when we heard from the panel on comparison of differing approaches to workouts, uh, Judge Daniel Costa from Brazil spoke, and Brazil recently adopted the model law uh, and other amendments to its uh, insolvency laws. Brazil also recently, the courts adopted the GIN guidelines, the Judicial Insolvency Network guidelines that permit communication, court-to-court -court communication. Um, are there ongoing efforts within Argentina to reform or revise its insolvency laws? Uh, let me stop with that question. You know what? Unfortunately, our government is busy with some other issues. Um, bankruptcy law is not one of their uh, main uh, concerns in this moment. Although there are many people and many lawyers and, and some of us trying to, to get not only the, re, uh, the, the possibility of adopting the model law, we, we, we have a law, we present it to the, to the Senate, but nothing happened. And we worked hard with uh, some other colleagues and nothing happened. And uh, I wish someday our government realizes how important it is for, for everything, uh, not only for, 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 for practitioners, but we, we live in a global world and we need the model law, but our government seems not to realize that. I don't know, they're, they're, 
we are we are having really hard problems in many areas, and uh, I think uh, something should be done. So I want to try and uh, picking up on some of Sushil's arguments and uh, Judge just, Glenn. I'm Justice. sorry. Uh, okay. This is, uh, this is Judge Swain. I understand that in the chat we have a question from Augustin Verdeja Prieto, um, but I think I'm I'm sorry. I was premature in interrupting you because the question's not fully written out in the chat yet. So <laughs> perhaps you can go on and. I, I was just going to comment that in, in Sushil's arguments and in Justice Abdullah's ruling, uh, it highlighted a difference in approach uh, the US courts in Chapter 15 and the UK courts. So you think back to yesterday, the first the panel on limits on collective action through global proceedings, the, the, the discussion between uh, Justice Zaccaroli and uh, Judge Gropper about the different approaches that the US and the UK have taken to, is the model law procedural, as the UK seems to say, or does it have substantive effect as the US seems to do? Uh, that same tension, I think, was apparent in the distressed investing panel at the end of the day yesterday, which had a very lively discussion. Uh, and so these are real current issues that courts around the world are grappling with. I would just make a plug for the last panel on deconstruction of a cross-border case, which I'll be moderating at the end of the day. Um, and some of these issues are yet fleshed out there as well. So those are current issues. Uh, are there anybody else who has any questions? Mark? So we do have the full question now in the chat. Yeah, go ahead if you will. Um, this is a question for Justice Abdullah. The treatment of upstream guarantees is not unanimous in all US judicial circuits. In Mexico, secured creditors now have an express right to accept a diminution of the value of their guarantees. The specific question to Justice Abdullah is, what would you do in Singapore about this issue? Well, I, I thank you for the question. I, I think insofar as it could operate as a discharge, uh, if we were to regard it as a discharge of these, uh, uh, of that value of the guarantee in uh, Mexico, and, uh, and for, for argument's sake, uh, there is perhaps less of a nexus or the nexus is tenuous, then I think the courts might still be inclined to accept and uh, give effect to it nonetheless. I, I think the primary concern uh, with our test of nexus, which we've derived from uh, other jurisdictions, is really just to ensure that uh, what is being proposed is uh, done bona fide uh, with the object of uh, resuscitating the company. And there could actually, I think, be other mechanisms or other safeguards that could be proposed in a, an appropriate case that would actually answer uh, to the same effect as a nexus uh, test. So if there's an express right to accept a diminution, I think that might actually pass my sentencing point. We might recognize it uh, in, uh, our, in our deliberations. Thank you. Uh, I don't know whether Sushi has a different view. Uh, no, 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 Judge. I, I, I think, uh, as you say, nexus is, is a big part of this. But if mm -hmm. there, is a, there is general acceptance of the diminution, I would be surprised if we didn't seriously consider it. Thank you. Mark? Thank you, Judge Glenn, and thanks to the panel. That presentation really made the hour fly by. Um, another question, though, for Fernando, if I might. Given the circumstances presented here, where the court was willing to approve a plan that provided for third-party releases in favor of the Singapore subsidiary, what was the strategic thinking behind attempting to include that subsidiary in the petition to begin with, what additional benefits or burdens might have been encountered had the court admitted that portion of the petition that sought to include the subsidiary? Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, it's nice to see you. Um, 
Okay, yeah, the benefit there is that this Patagonia Finance at the end of the day is the holding company of another subsidiary with uh, <clears throat> has pledged, uh, which is at, uh, at the end, the owner of the mine. So you have Patagonia Finance, then you have Golden Opportunities, and then you have Mina de Oro, which is the, the mine owner. And in addition to the guarantee, uh, Patagonia Finance, uh, in order to secure its obligations under the guarantee, uh, it has pledged the shares held by it in golden opportunities. So if at the end of the day, there uh, it is a liquidation of uh, Patagonia Finance, uh, those shares will be um, um, subject to um, a sale, uh, a procedure for the, for the sale. Um, so the idea of releasing the guarantor is in order to keep uh, the asset of the parent in Argentina, which is at the end of the day, the mine. All right, let me express my thanks again to Chief Judge Swain as the moderator, to Justice O'Reilly and Justice Abdullah, and to our two uh, uh, litigants who argued, Sushil Nair and Fernando Hernandez. Uh, we're gonna take a half hour break we're gonna resume at 11.30. I wanna remind everybody who's appearing virtually that you have to sign in separately for the next session. Don't forget to get the uh, uh, CLE code from CHAPT and put it in when you get the form tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>